Of all the things that changed my life for the better most quickly, it was learning how to set goals. And mastering this unique process can have a powerful effect on your life too. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met Mr. Shelf, he asked me if he could see my current list of goals. He said, let me see your list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. Maybe that's the best way I can help you right now. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or at home somewhere? I said, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we better start. Then he added, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean that if I had a list of goals, that would change my bank balance? He said, drastically. That day I became a student of how to set goals. And sure enough, when I learned how, my whole life changed. My income, my bank account, my personality, my lifestyle, my accomplishments. So I'd like to share with you the best I have learned and practiced on goal setting. First of all, I'd like to say that we are all affected by five factors. The first is environment. The second is events. The third is knowledge. The fourth is results. And the fifth and often overlooked factor that affects our lives is our view of the future, our dreams. I won't get into all of these influences here, but let me concentrate on the fifth one, dreams. Of all these five influences, make sure your dreams are the greatest influence on your daily decisions and activities. Put another way, make sure that the greatest pull on you is the pull of the future. For your dreams to greatly influence you, for the future to pull you, your future must be well planned. There are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other with anticipation. Guess how many people face the future with apprehension? Why? They don't have it well designed. And without really thinking about it, they have probably bought someone else's view of how to live. You will face the future with anticipation when you have planned a future you can get excited about. When you have designed your future results in advance. In this way, the future will capture your imagination. It will exert an enormous influence on you. And to design your future, you must have goals. Well-defined goals are like a magnet. They pull you in their direction. And the better you have defined them, the better you have described them, the harder you work on them, the stronger they pull. And they pull you through all kinds of difficulties too. Without goals, it is easy to let life deteriorate to the point where you're just making a living. It is not difficult to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. We all have a choice. We can either make a living or design a life. Mr. Shove said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence but not enough reasons. That's the key, if you had enough reasons. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solutions will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? 
Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tapes. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. That's one of the best reasons. I have some millionaire friends who keep working 10 to 12 hours a day making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because of the joy, pleasure, and satisfaction that come to them from being constant winners. To them, money is not their main drive. It's not the money. It's the journey. Once in a while, someone says to me, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million. Because he'd just quit. Family is another reason or motivator for doing well. Some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do things for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man who once said to me, Mr. Rohn, to do everything I want to do around the world with my family, I need at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a man's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else? It's powerful. Benevolence. The desire to share can be a powerful reason for wanting to achieve. Some people do extremely well gathering up resources so they can then be benefactors. When Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnet, died, his desk was opened and in one of the desk drawers was found a slip of paper. On that slip of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life and he wrote it when he was in his 20s. On that slip of paper he had written, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. That's terrific. He was so inspired by that goal that during the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And during the last half of his life, he gave it all away. How powerful. What has you turned on? What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day and staying up late? What has you inspired? Next question, what's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what negative philosophy of life I had allowed to limit me and had me turned off and I got that cured. Then I found a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me at age 25, they have never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to do something unique with my life. So here's how simple goal setting is. Change my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down. Make a list. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? What skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do, ordinary things you'd like to do, right? Silly little things you'd like to do, very important things you'd like to do. Decide, decide on all that stuff and write it down, write it down, write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private list. If it's really private, you know, on your list, put some stuff in code where nobody can understand it if this list <laughs> fell into unfriendly hands. Okay. And simple things, whatever. 
foolish things. Doesn't matter. It's your list. I had a little revenge on my first list. Budget finance, who used to harass me. I got two or three payments behind this one guy called incessantly. Said, we're going to come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. <laughs> Keep your lists of goals so that it shows your growth, shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands what's valuable. Setting goals. It doesn't matter how small, foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. <laughs> thought that was good. <laughs> I like that. Have you got this profound thing now in setting goals? Here's how profound it is. Decide what you want, write it down. Get together with your wife, decide. Get together with your kids, decide. Get together with your business colleagues, decide, write it down, make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is. Now, let me give you one more scenario on setting goals. When I started making my first list, Mr. Shope said, Mr. Rohn, looks like we're gonna be together for a while. He said, I've got a suggestion for you. He said, I think one of the first goals you ought to set, you're 25 year old American male, sure you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. You got a family worth it. Reasons makes the difference. And he said, you've got every reason to do this. He said, why don't you, among all the goals you're gonna set, he said, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire, this is America. All the possibilities are available. Why don't you set a goal eh? to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. Millionaire, enough zeros to impress your accountant. Millionaire. And he said, here's why. Now I thought, the man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth the price of being here today if you can capture what I'm about to share with you. Here's what Mr. Shove said. Set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest classes in one sentence I've ever received in my life. That a goal that'll make you stretch that far for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for? To see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. Major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become that makes you valuable. So Shelf said, set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Let me give you the key phrase on setting goals. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Always keep that in mind. What will this make of me? If I set this goal and go for it, not only will I achieve it, but what will it make of me in the process? What a whole new concept on setting goals. Now there's two parts to this, and then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part now in this goal setting for what you become. Number one, don't set your goals too low. Interesting, we teach in leadership. Don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure's on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level. What we expect of each other in terms of excellence, far beyond average. Why? So that we can each grow, so that we can receive from the group, we can contribute to the group, something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit. Go where the demands are high. Go where the expectations are strong so that it'll provoke you, push you urgently, insist 
that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years, that you grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. The guy says, well, I don't need much. Well, then you don't need to become much. <laughs> now here's the last part on setting goals. Don't compromise, don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. If I'd have known how much it was gonna cost me, I never would have paid, but I didn't know. So don't sell out. Ancient phrase says, count cost, count cost, count cost. Don't sell out. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise your virtues. Don't compromise your philosophy. Key. Here's the key word, beware. Two good words from ancient script. One, behold the positive word. Behold the possibilities, behold the opportunity. Behold the drama, behold the awesomeness, behold the uniqueness. Behold the majesty, behold, behold. What a good word. But here's the other word, beware, beware, beware. Don't sell out. Now we're going to take some time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, but also to help you create the kind of life you may have always dreamed about living but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper and at the top of it, write the words, long range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to jot down the answers. All right. Let's start this exercise. The basic question you are going to answer is, what do I want within the next one to 10 years? I want you to take about 12 to 15 minutes and make a list of at least 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. The way you enjoy life best is to wrap up one goal and start right on the next one. Don't linger too long at the table of success. The only way to enjoy another meal is to get hungry. Another thing to check for on your list is that you have included goals for each of these three important categories. First, make sure you've listed your economic goals, your goals for income, profits, and productivity. Second, make certain your list includes material items you want, tangibles, such as a home, a car, a boat, furniture, or jewelry. Don't attach the wrong importance to things, but they are important. Third, you'll want to include on your list goals for personal development. Write down all your personal development goals, your goals to be more physically fit, to lose weight, to be more decisive, to be a more effective leader, to be a better communicator, to learn another language. Of course, there are other types of goals to consider, family goals, social goals, lifestyle goals. This is pretty heavy homework, but remember, whether or not you do your homework shows up in the marketplace as well as in the classroom. You may find that some of your goals you thought at first glance were important are not important after all. Do some reflecting, refining, and revising. The point is, Right now, try to have approximately four one-year, three-year, five-year, and ten-year goals that you truly believe in, that inspire you, that you've sold yourself on. When these goals and the reasons you want to obtain them are each clearly described in a brief paragraph, transfer this information to a journal or some type of notebook that you can carry with you easily and refer to often. It's essential to set aside some time every week to review all of your goals, to rearrange them, redo them, restructure them, to add goals, 
or to tear up the whole list and start over. Goal setting is not something you do just once. It's a continual process. Also, you must constantly check your progress toward your goals. You don't want to fall too far behind on, or worse, lose sight of, your important goals. Now, just as important as your long-range goals are your short-range goals. Your goals for tomorrow, next week, next month, six months from now. These are goals you can accomplish within the next year, the immediate future. We call these goals confidence builders. When you work hard, burn the midnight oil, and accomplish these little things, it builds your confidence to go for your long-range goals. Write down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to have or accomplish in the next year. How you set up this list is up to you. You might want to break it down by week or by month. Set it up in whatever way works well for you. Part of the fun of having a list is being able to check off something as obtained or completed. Every week, try to check off at least one thing on your list of short-term goals. And when you are able to check off something major, something on your list of long-range goals, celebrate. Make winning joyful. Congratulate yourself. It is very important to celebrate progress. We grow from two experiences. One is the joy of winning, and the other is the pain of losing. Here's what that also means. Make losing painful. Put it on yourself. If you set something up, fooled around, didn't pull it off, put it on yourself. And get around people who will help in this area. Hey, don't join an easy crowd. Go where the expectations are high, where the pressure to perform is high. It's how we grow. I'm certain that part of the reason why people let goal setting slide is because it is a lot of work. As I said, you'll be constantly revising your lists of short range and long range goals, rearranging them, refining them, redesigning them, establishing different priorities, adding new goals, perhaps deleting others. It's interesting that so many people work hard on their jobs, but they don't work hard on their futures. They let that slide. Some people live such mediocre lives that at the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They just go through life with their fingers crossed. I know most people don't make definite plans, but don't let that be you. The guy says, well, you work where I work, but the time you get home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half of the night and plan, plan, plan. And this is the guy who's behind on his car note. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But I've discovered that you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner, a good goal setter. You've heard the old saying, the people who fail to plan are planning to fail. It's true. So work on your plans. Put yourself in the top few percent who put this power to work for themselves. Writing your goals down also shows you are serious. And to do better, you must get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better. But remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse. And that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50 and he's broke and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans.